Hello and welcome to Breaking Down, a podcast looking back at the Twilight Saga. This week we're doing a deep dive into Chapter 7, titled Nightmare. So we start with Bella getting home from the beach. She's just been told by Jacob that Edward's a vampire. He pretty much came out and said the Cullens are vampires. They've been around for generations. They're the same people. They don't age. They're the cold ones. They're vampires. He's spelling it out for her. And the whole drive home, she was just turning it over in her head thinking about it. So she gets home. She tells Charlie she's not hungry and she runs up to her room and locks the door. And in a nice little throwback moment, she digs through her desk and finds some old headphones and she plugs them into a CD player. And she gets a CD and she just blasts it. And of course, Stephanie Meyer being Stephanie Meyer, she gives us a full rundown of the mechanics of her playing a CD. So she digs through her desk to find the headphones. Then she plugs them into a little CD player. She picks up a CD that Phil gave her for Christmas. Then she pops the CD into place and lays down on the bed. And then she puts on the headphones, then she hits play, and then she turns up the volume until it hurts her ears. And then she closes her eyes, but the light still intruded, so she added a pillow over the top half of her face. (laughs) Why did we need a (laughs) step-by-step breakdown of her putting on a CD? And also, Bella, just turn the light off. If the light's bothering you, you're welcome to turn the light off. You don't have to cover your face with the pillow. Just turn the light off. It's night time, it's raining outside, there's no natural light. She's talking about an overhead light. She says later she wakes up in the middle of the night and the light's still on, so just turn the bloody light off, Bella. So what she's really trying to do is she's just trying to drown out her thoughts with the music. And so she's just listening to the same CD on a loop just to, just to drown out thinking about vampires. And then she falls asleep. So basically in the dream, she's in the forest and Jacob Black's there and he's tugging on her hand, pulling her towards some other part of the forest. And she's like, Jacob, what's wrong? And he's like, Bella, you have to run. You have to get out of here. And then Mike's there as well. And he's like, this way, Bella, come on. And she's like, what? What's going on? And then basically she's just predicting that Jacob's a werewolf because then Jacob falls to the ground. He's shaking. And then he becomes a wolf and the wolf's growling towards the shore. And Mike's like, Bella, you got to run, bitch. And she's ignoring Mike because just like in real life, in dream life, she doesn't like Mike and he doesn't get it. So she says instead of running away, she is transfixed by this glowing light coming towards her from the beach. And it's Edward. And his skin is faintly glowing, but his eyes are black and dangerous. And he's holding up one hand, beckoning her to come. And she takes the step forward towards Edward. And then his teeth turn all sharp and pointed. And he says, trust me. And she takes another step. And that's when the wolf launches himself towards the vampire with his fangs aiming for Edward's jugular and Bella screams no and then she wrenches herself upright out of bed and she's awake. So now she's having premonitions. (laughs) We've got vampires, we've got werewolves and now we've got Phoebe from Bloody Charmed getting a premonition in the middle of the night. (laughs) She's been told that Edward's a vampire but she hasn't been told about the skin glowing. She's just... (laughs) She's just plucked that out of thin air and she hasn't really been told that Jacob's a werewolf either, but she's predicted that as well. So Bella's got a touch of the supernatural. She's a bit of a medium, apparently. So anyway, she's she's woken up and she's like, oh my God, I'm fully dressed. My bedroom light's on (laughs) and it's 5.30 in the morning. So she groans and she rolls back onto bed, but she kicks off her shoes and takes off her jeans but she's still on the bed and she pulls the pillow back over her eyes, but no, she can't get back to sleep. And I'm like, get up and turn the light off. (laughs) Why is she not turning a light off? But she's like, no, must be because my subconscious wants me to work through these images in my head, not because the light's on. So she says, I'll just get up. But she's like, I'll put it off for a bit longer. I'll go have a shower. And it says that she grabs her bathroom bag and then goes to have a shower. And I'm thinking, Why do you have a bathroom bag? Just have all your shit in the shower. Have your shampoo and your conditioner, etc. ready in the bathroom. She's not camping. She's not in in boarding school where she's got to take a little bath caddy to go to the group showers. She's at home. Why does she have a bath bag? Is she staying at a youth hostel? No, she's staying at a dad Charlie's house where she has a room. I'm sure Charlie wouldn't mind if you just left a loofah in the bathroom. 
right? So Stephanie Meyer gives us more detail about how she's drying her hair and she's wrapping herself in a towel and she's putting on sweatpants and making a bed. Like, I don't give a shit. Anyway, she finally sits herself at the computer and she has a little, a little moan about how slow the internet is and how the modem's shit. <laughs> so she goes and eats cereal and then Stephanie tells us that she washes up the bowl and then the spoon and then she dries them and then she puts them away. I do not care. Then she puts herself back in front of the computer. And this little scene actually gave me a lot of PTSD back from when pop-up blockers weren't a thing because she's just describing that she's getting multiple pop-ups. She's clicking through, canceling out of all these different pop-ups. And it's just, it really took me back to that dark place back in the, back in the early 2000s. Tell you what, my life changed when good pop-up blockers were invented. Praise be to the pop-up blockers doing the Lord's work. So after she's cancelled out of all the pop-ups, she says, Eventually, I made it to my favourite search engine. I shot down a few more pop-ups and then typed in one word, vampire. (laughs) Favourite search engine? (laughs) Just say Google. Maybe she's run and ask Jeeves. You know, for, for a time in 2010, I did use Bing. There was a good three weeks there where I used Bing and then I came to my senses and I went back to Google. So she's asked Jeeves about vampires. That's, that's, that's what I'm getting from that. She says lots of weird results came up, but you know, about movies and TVs and games. But then she found a promising site called Vampires A to Z. <laughs> that's her promising site. She thought, you know what? That looks, that looks credible. That'll, that'll have everything I need. She says once it loaded, and then she clicked out of all the ads that popped up. <laughs> The screen was finished and it was a simple white background with black text. Academic looking, she said. <laughs> like that's academic looking? <laughs> Plain black and white text? <laughs> Bella would be a sucker for fake news. If Bella was alive today, or if this was written in 2020, Bella would be, she would be eating up all those Facebook fake news articles that get posted. She'd be talking about Hillary's emails. <laughs> She'd be into all the COVID conspiracies. Anything that she reads with a white background and black lettering, that's just true to her. So basically she does some light reading on vampire mythology. She reads about this Filipino vampire guy called Danag, who one day when a woman cut a finger, he sucked a wound and he was like, wow, that tastes delicious. And then he just became a vampire. And I looked that up and that's apparently a real story. And then she's reading through more descriptions I'm looking for anything that sounds familiar. And I'm like, have you not seen a vampire movie? Why did she need to Google this? She's never watched Buffy. She never watched Dracula. She didn't watch that great movie with Hugh Jackman and Van Helsing. I mean, Van Helsing came out in 2004. This was written in 2005. I mean, surely she had just seen it a year ago. It was a very current topical movie. She didn't watch that. She missed Van Helsing. Why has she got a... Ask Jeeves about vampires. She never watched Interview with the Vampire with Tom Cruise. Missed that one as well. She never saw Blade. I mean, come on. But then three different myths catch her attention. There's the Roman Varacolacci, who could appear as a beautiful pale-skinned human. (gasps) Sounds like Edward. And then there's the Slovakian Nalapsi, which is a creature so strong and fast, it could massacre an entire village in a single hour. And then there's the Stregoni Benefici, which is an Italian vampire, which was said to be on the side of goodness and a mortal enemy of all evil vampires. So she's piecing that together and she's like, that sounds like Edward. She's like, I know my Edward and that sounds like Edward. So she puts together a list of everything that she's noticed about Edward that matches up with the different vampire myths that she's been reading. So there's speed, strength, beauty, the pale skin, the eyes that shift color, And then there's Jacob's criteria, which is blood drinkers, enemies of the werewolf, cold skinned and immortal. And she's like, a lot of these myths just don't match up with everything. (laughs) And then thank God she actually acknowledges that the one thing about vampires that's consistent in the movies is that they can't go into the sunlight or else they'd burn. And that they traditionally sleep in coffins and only come out at night. And I'm like, thank you. Why are these vampires different? The glittery skin in sunlight thing is such bullshit. She just wanted them to go out in the day. Stephanie just thought, you know what? I want Edward to be a high school student. Let's make him go out in the day. 
is so silly. It's so, so silly. So she gets frustrated and she's embarrassed that she's sitting in her room researching vampires at 5.30 in the morning. So she pulls out the computer cord, not shutting it down properly. And haven't we all been there where you've just been so over it? You're like, I'm not, I'm not shutting down. I'm not closing my apps. I'm just pulling the shit out. I'm just pulling the plug. That's how you know you're over it. And so she just had to get out of the house. So she goes for a walk around the forest. <laughs> so she lives next to a forest. Did, <laughs> did we know that? Or did we just assume that because it's bumfuck nowhereville that every house has a forest in their backyard? So she gets to the middle of the forest and she sits down to have a little break. And then she's like, oh no, this reminds me too much of my dream last night. And she says, here in the trees, it was much easier to believe the absurdities that embarrassed me indoors. Nothing had changed in this forest for thousands of years. And all the myths and legends of a hundred different lands seemed much more likely in this green haze than they had in my clear cut bedroom. Okay, I buy that. I buy that. That's not a bad paragraph, actually. I'll give that to Stephanie. I feel like she captured that idea quite well. But then she's like, I've got to force myself to answer these two vital questions. And the first one is, is it possible that what Jacob had said about the Cullens could be true? So immediately she's thinking, no, no, it's silly. It doesn't make any sense. It's not rational. And I'm thinking, how about you just go and ask Jacob's dad? How about that? Because they seem to believe it. Why don't you just go have a chat with them? And she thinks about everything that she's observed. So there's the impossible speed, the strength, the eye color shifting from black to gold and back again. She's obsessed with the eye color, remember? The inhuman beauty. Okay. The pale, frigid skin. (laughs) Then there's the fact that they never seem to eat, the disturbing grace with which they move, and the way he sometimes spoke, with unfamiliar cadences and phrases that better fit the style of a turn of the century novel. Have we actually heard Edward speak like that? I don't think he's been saying anything that Mr. Darcy-ish. Like, really? He's just been chuckling. He's been chuckling and asking her not to fall in the ocean and calling her clumsy and that he's dangerous and evil and all that bullshit. He's never really said, like, let me doth take a turn of the room with you, my lady. Like, he's not said that bullshit. He's not exactly walking around talking like Oscar Wilde. Then there's also the fact that he skipped class the day they were doing blood typing. He hadn't said no to the beach trip till he heard where they were going. And that he seemed to know what everyone around him was thinking. Then he would have known where they were going on the beach trip then. If he can read minds. But we'll side by that. And while she's still tossing over whether or not they're vampires, she pretty much says Edward Cullen was not human. He was something more. And I'm like, great, great. She's, she's coming around. She's figuring it out. So that's her answer to the first question. And the second question is, what's she going to do about it? So she's asking if Edward really is a vampire, then is she going to date him? (laughs) That's, (laughs) she's thinking, should I date him or should I run? And she said she had the option to just ignore him, cancel all the plans, pretend like he doesn't exist and tell him to leave her alone to, you know, save herself the agony and, you know, to, to make sure she doesn't get killed. And she said, no, can't do that. That's too painful. I can't ignore that beautiful face. So she pretty much decides to do nothing. (laughs) And she starts reasoning, being like, he's never done anything to hurt me. In fact, if it weren't for him, I would have been a dent in Tyler's fender. She's just convincing herself. Then she realizes that in her dream, when she screamed at Jacob, the werewolf lunging at Edward, she wasn't screaming about Edward being a vampire. She was screaming worried that the werewolf would hurt him. So she's just, she's drunk the Kool-Aid already. It's too late. It's too late. And she said, and I knew in that I had my answer. I didn't know if there was ever a choice, really. I was already in too deep. And there's a no, no, you're not in too deep. You've not even kissed him. You're not, you're not deep at all. Just call him up and say, hey, I don't want to go to Seattle with you. Just look him up in the phone book. Hit him up on MySpace. They had MySpace back then. I mean, she'd have to click through a few pop-ups to get to it, but hit him up. Hit him up on MySpace and say, I'm done. Not that you had to be done from anything because nothing ever started. But no, she's in too deep, apparently. Yep, so she's decided she's all in, so she goes back home, does some bloody homework, and she feels more serene than she's felt in a long time because the making decisions was the hard part for her. But once the decision was made, she just followed through with it. (laughs) So 
So she's like, oh God, I've decided to stick with my vampire boyfriend who's not my boyfriend. So let it be, let it be. Que sera, que sera. She even says, I should be afraid. I knew I should be, but I couldn't feel the right kind of fear. (sighs) She's got the hots for him. That's what it is. She goes to bed and the next day it's a bright sunny day. And she skips over to the window, stunned that there was hardly a cloud in the sky. And those there were just fleecy little white puffs that couldn't possibly be carrying any rain. (laughs) Bella the meteorologist strikes again. (laughs) She trots downstairs and Charlie's like, good morning, nice day, isn't it? And she's like, yep. And we get this really bizarre paragraph where she just starts describing how attractive Charlie is. (laughs) It's a bit disturbing. She says, he smiled back, his brown eyes crinkling around the edges. When Charlie smiled, it was easy to see why he and my mother had jumped too quickly into an early marriage. When he smiled, I could see a little more of the man who had run away with Renee. It's like, okay, now you want to bang your dad too? (laughs) She gets to school early, so she goes and sits by a picnic bench and just daydreams for a little bit. And then she hears Mike calling her name out. He's like, Bella, Bella. And she looks around and she's like, oh, hey, Mike. Like she's actually positive back because it's sunny. So she's a different person. (laughs) She even says, hey, Mike, I called waving back, unable to be half-hearted on a morning like this. (laughs) So it's like, you're being half-hearted intentionally every other time then. (laughs) And guys, I got to say it. I'm turning off Mike. I don't know why I've defended him for so long because he's actually a bit of a creep at this moment. So he says, I never noticed before your hair has red in it. And he catches a strand of her hair that was fluttering in the breeze. And he like tucks it back in behind her ear. What a fucking creep move that is. It's like, you've known her for two months, Mike. Lay off. And then because Mike just never gets the hint, he asks her on a date out. And she's like, oh, mate, no. And she just says, look, mate, I don't think that would be the best idea. And he's like, what? Why not? And she's like, I think it would hurt Jessica's feelings, you moron. And he's like shocked. He's like, Jessica? Oh, that bitch from biology? (laughs) And she's like, yes, Mike, are you blind? And he's like, oh, okay. So they walk to class in silence. And then she meets up with Jessica who's bubbling with enthusiasm because her, Angela and Lauren are going to Port Angeles to go dress shopping. And she's like, Bella, you should come. And Bella's like, I don't know, guys, I'm lame. Then Jessica's banging on about the dance again as they walk between classes. But Bella's just ignoring them as always, just in her own head, wondering about the Cullens. She's obsessed with the Cullens, which she thinks they're vampires, so fair enough. And they get to the cafeteria and Bella freaks out because the Cullens aren't there. There was no sign of Edward or any of his family. Desolation hit me with crippling strength. And I'm, I'm sorry, but, but their absence shouldn't make you feel like that. That's a bad sign. And she had said yes to going dress shopping. But by the time she gets home, Jessica says, actually, scrap that. We'll go tomorrow night because Mike asked me out for dinner. So great. We're getting somewhere on the Jessica Mike subplot. She emails with her mum, then she reads some Jane Austen, she falls asleep in the backyard. Oh, and I just think it's so funny that the Cullens just are useless on a sunny day. They're just like, oh, sunny day, can't go to school, can't go to work. Is Carlisle rescheduling surgeries on sunny days? Like, I'd hate to be at Forks Hospital needing like a, a kidney transplant, and it's all lined up, kidneys ready to go, and then my doctor's got to cancel because it's sunny outside. Like what a, what an impractical career for him to go into, especially since he must be coming into contact with a lot of blood. So that must be a lot of self-control on Carlisle's side. Maybe you could have gone into a different career. Maybe you could have gone into landscaping, Carlisle. Maybe he could have been a mechanic or is he just in that career so he can secretly pinch from the blood bank? That could be a possibility. So her and Charlie watch TV together. And she says, oh, dad, can I go to Port Angeles tomorrow night with the gals to go dress shopping? And he's like, but you're not going to the dance, right? And she's like, oh, I'm helping them find dresses. She's like, I wouldn't have to explain this to a woman. Like, oh, you poor thing. But Charlie's cool. So he's like, yep, sure. Do whatever you want. She's like, oh, but you'll have to cook dinner for yourself. Is that all right? And he says, Bells, I fed myself for 17 years before you got here. And he calls her Bells. So he does use that as a nickname. It's been chapters and chapters and chapters, but he's finally called a Bells again. So 
I apologise to Charlie for assuming that he would never call the bells ever again. And then the next day is sunny again, so she dresses for the warmer weather in a deep blue V-neck blouse. Ooh, (laughs) she's getting the girls out. That's what I'm reading from that. But she's already depressed because as soon as she pulls into the parking lot at school, she can't see the silver Volvo anywhere. Not Volvo. She can't see the silver Volvo anywhere. I've got iced Volvos on the brain. So all day she just keeps hoping that Edward will turn up, but he doesn't. So after school, she goes home, she drops off her shit, and then she gets in the car with Jessica, excited to go to Port Angeles. And that's the chapter. And the next chapter is called Port Angeles. Oh, I hope it's not boring. Because that was a pretty boring chapter. We had to have Bella reasoning with herself about the vampire-ish. If she never reasoned and thought about it, then I would be upset. But, oh, the, the, the scenes at school are just not interesting. Not interesting. But we're out of school. We're going to Port Angeles. I think I remember some exciting things happening. So, whoop, whoop. Here we go. So as always, thank you to everyone who has rated and reviewed us. Uh, Tenno B on iTunes said, love listening to this podcast so I don't have to actually read the books. <laughs> Glad we could be of service, Tenno B. If you would like to email me your thoughts, it's breakingdownpod at gmail.com or you can tweet us at podbreakingdown. I'll see you next week. Bye.